Welcome back, everyone. I'm so excited you're joining us today because I'm here with Arian Radman, the co-founder of CoachUp. Thank you so much for being with me today. Hey, thanks very much for having me. So before we really dive into how you guys built this marketplace, connecting athletes with professional coaches, I want to talk about your personal experiences with a professional coach because it's so much more than just improving your game. It is, yeah. I mean, um, you know, personally, when I was growing up, I had a private coach, so sailing was my sport. Um, and I got into it really by chance just because I was bored one summer and I uh, needed something to do. Um, but I was a little bit of a unique case because neither one of my parents knew anything about the sport. So when it came time that I really wanted to get involved and started com- and wanted to compete, they were kind of at a loss of, of what to do and where to go. And it was hard to find uh, not just somebody who uh, you know, understood the sport and could teach me, but could do it on a regular basis and was someone that you know, they kind of knew and trusted, right? Because they're going to be you know, leaving their child with, uh, you know, with this person. So uh, they, they struggled to find a private coach. They finally did just by going through you know, sailing magazines and opening the phone book and, and giving, um, giving them a call. But had a service like CoachUp existed, it, uh, you know, it would have been much, much easier for them to, to find a coach and find someone that they could trust. Um, and the thing is, you know, I, I sailed growing up, and uh, it was a big part of my life in college. So I went to BU and sailed for four years on their, t- on their team. Um, and it kind of has a very far-reaching effect because you know, I still keep in touch with all of my teammates from BU. Um, so, you know, private coaches, yes, it, it does help you improve your sport and your game, but kind of goes beyond that, too. You know, a lot of folks kind of point back to coaches as being one of the most influential people in their lives. So, you know, it goes to, you know, uh, work ethic, commitment. Uh, a lot of people, you know, you'll see their confidence start to improve, their self-esteem start to improve uh, just from working with a private coach. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, the benefits are not just on the field or on the court. They're kind of far-reaching in, in life benefits, too, because, you know, that, that private coach becomes more of a, of a role model than just a pure, you know, sports coach. When it comes to applying the learnings from your coach to your business and just your life today, what would you say is the core way that it's impacted you? I mean, definitely work ethic, beyond a doubt. That's kind of the biggest lesson that I've learned so far, um, and it's kind of the, the common thread, uh, whether it was you know, my private coach growing up, uh, my actual team coach at, at BU. Uh, most, most everything boils down to you know, working hard, and the harder you work, the, uh, you know, the luckier you get, so to speak. But... Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the, the biggest takeaway I have is, you know, nothing, nothing comes easy, but if you work for it, you can more or less achieve anything you want to do. So uh, that's the biggest, I guess, impact that most of the, the coaches that, that I've had growing up have, have really had on my life. When you talk about hard work in that light, it reminds me of the quote that Jordan, your co-founder, used when he was announcing your partnership with Steph Curry. He said, This was before he won MVP. So he said, regardless (laughs) of whether Stefan wins the NBA championship this year and earns the MVP trophy, he will spend his summer in the gym training with his private coach to improve his game. That's what makes him a star and a winner on and off the court. I love that because from the outside, it seems like as an entrepreneur, we were just saying before we got started, it seems like Coach Up started and exploded. Now you're super successful, you have celebrity partnerships, but that's not how it is. When it comes to the learning through the hard work, what have you learned about pushing yourself to get to the next level? Um, we learned a lot of things. And so, you know, like, like any, I guess, overnight success, it took us years and years and years <laughs> to, to get here. Um, and, you know, still, it's, there's tons of hard work and, you know, it's still an uphill battle every single day. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the, there's... Benefits to hard work everywhere. And uh, like starting a business, a lot of people don't realize uh, kind of how much work goes in up front. Uh, a lot of people will see kind of the, the back end and, you know, people read our blog and see our stories and see our partnerships and, you know, just assume that all those things kind of came together. But, you know, it's, uh, it's not the case. You know, like we, we were talking before, our, our, our partnership with Steph Curry, we've, we've been working on that for about a year because mm-hmm. um, we know that, you know, Steph has really good work ethic. His story ties in perfectly with ours. Uh, we knew that he was, uh, you know, the caliber of athlete he was, and we knew that, you know, he, he wanted to get involved with our business. But, uh, I mean, those things don't come together overnight, and it takes uh, a, lot of, a lot of time and effort. Uh, and that's really kind of the biggest limiting factor when you, when you start a business is you have to put a lot of time and effort because nothing, nothing comes easy, uh, especially for a startup when you're, you know, 
when you're small and no one really knows who you are, uh, it's very difficult to kind of break in. And you know, the only the only way to do that is to kind of cultivate it over a long long period of time, and uh, you know, talk to a lot of people, talk, cultivate relationships, and just put the effort in. You know, there's there's no shortcuts. You just have to uh, you got to put the work in. One of the things you guys decided to do was bootstrap the company in the early days. And like you and I were saying, that makes it a lot harder than having a couple <laughs> million dollars in the bank. You had to distill it down to the three benefits of bootstrapping, for you guys at least. What would they be? Uh, well, we touched on this a little bit when we were talking earlier. But uh, so one of the things I think that happens when you, uh, you know, have a ton of cash and capital on hand is it's kind of one of those problems of, uh, you know, you you think that throwing cash at every problem that comes up is the solution, and it's really not. So, uh, for me, one of the things that I think I would I would point to as a benefit is, um, I guess, clarity of a lot of the solutions and approaches that we came to, because uh, we knew that we didn't have just a ton of cash and capital to throw at them. So. You know, it took us. It was a lot of um, kind of hard work. We kind of had to roll up our sleeves and kind of get down, down and dirty, and figure out um, the right solutions. But we had to do it in such a way that um, it didn't really cloud our judgment and cloud our, uh, you know, our conclusions by just saying, "Oh, we can solve this by just throwing a ton of cash at it." Um, so I think clarity is definitely one. Um, uh, let's see. I don't know. Uh, I'm struggling to come up with, with a couple uh, of others because th that's really kind of the, the biggest thing to me is like figuring out what, what solution works best um, and not, being, not having your, your judgment clouded. Um, I think it yeah. lends to what, the way you described it in your blog, which I love. I, I think it's one of the best <laughs> ways I've actually heard it, it described so far is that when you have a lot of money in the bank that maybe you don't necessarily need at the moment or you could find an alternative way. You have a hammer in your hand and you start seeing <laughs> nails everywhere. Exactly. And that's even true if you have cash in your wallet and you see a shirt you like at the store. You're just more inclined to buy right. it. What was an example of the early days when you guys really had to hone in with your creativity and figure it out? Because like you said, the boat was burning and you had to save it. Yep, yep. And so that's another thing I would point to from having too much cash in the bank is there's no safety net. Uh, when you have a lot of cash in the bank, you can always fall back on that safety net and say, well, you know, whatever, we have, you know, X number of months of runway anyway. When you bootstrap, you don't really have that. It's kind of do or die and, you know, uh, yeah, the, the end of the road is coming and it's a lot nearer and it's a lot more of a motivation to, to work. Uh, and, and to not just work, but to have an outcome because you need to actually get things done. So you have to execute. So one, one of the earliest things that uh, our biggest problem is, you know, when you, when you build a marketplace, one of the biggest problems is always kind of the cold start problem. So you go from zero and, you know, you have to kind of build these two sides of the marketplace almost simultaneously. So for us, one of the biggest problems early on was how are we going to get enough coaches to, one, find out about us, and then once they found out about us, convince them to actually join our platform. And so, you know, that, that was an example. Uh, and, you know, uh, we've kind of transitioned as, as the business has grown. But initially, literally what we did is we sat down and we treated ourselves like private coaches and said, okay, if I was a private coach, where would I go to get more clients? Where would I go to advertise my services? And we literally did that. So we're like, okay, we went on, you know, places like Craigslist, places like LinkedIn, um, even even Facebook and some of the social media sites, um, and and basically we're like you know if I was a coach here these are the things I would use to advertise my services and so we treated ourselves like coaches but instead of advertising our services we were basically um, pushing coach up and so we would we would try to find what we called coach aggregation points like places where there are a lot of coaches trying to advertise themselves but you know maybe had having mixed success and so we would go and and literally manually reach out to them and message them and kind of pull them on, on the platform until we found some, some type of repeatable way that we could do this, um, you know, and not just expend a, a ton of energy and effort. So that was, you know, an initial example of we just didn't have, it didn't have a lot of cash. Like I would have loved to, you know, be able to just hire a bunch of people or hire a recruiter, or, you know, just go and, and advertise on some of these job sites and just, you know, do a ton of, of postings. But we, uh, we couldn't do that because we didn't have the cash. I really want to hone in on the marketplace, too, because I just talked to the founders of Campus Job, and they were sharing with me how difficult it is to build a marketplace, because even once you get people on the marketplace, you have to keep up with the balance. What have right. your experiences been? Did you have uh, more athletes or coaches first? 
So we started with the coach side, and the thought was, you know, we really needed the the supply side before we could go after the demand side. You know, it's one of those things where, um, and you can see this with other marketplaces too. People are going to go where they can get results. So, you know, if uh, if we're a coaching marketplace, but clients and athletes come here and there's no, you know, they can't find coaches to meet their needs, they're not going to stick around for long. So for us, our, our strategy was let's go after the supply side and let's really. Um, go after and build our, our coach database first so that we have something to offer when people come there. You know, if you think about it, it's, it's kind of weird. Like you don't want people to come to your site uh, if you're advertised, you know, solution, yeah. right. Yeah. We, you know, we have coaches and we'll set you up and then they, they search and they look and there's no coaches in their area. So, um, so we, def we definitely started on the coach side um, and then kind of waited till we, we hit a critical mass before we really started to, to advertise and go after the, uh, the athlete side of the marketplace. Um, but like you said, it's, it's always a balancing act and kind of what, what we did is we actually changed our approach a little bit as we started the business because our original plan was to start uh, just in Boston with maybe 10 sports, 10 sport verticals with maybe 10 coaches in each uh, and just kind of prove out the concept soup to nuts there and then really spread out city by city across the nation. Uh, and then we actually flipped that and, and instead of going you know, city by city like that, we actually just turned it up, you know, turned our, uh, our business on nationwide. And the reason why we did that is because we really wanted the market itself to dictate where we moved into, you know, if, uh, and it, it turned out it was, it was a pretty good move because right now, even though we're based in Massachusetts, we actually do more lessons in, uh, California, Florida, uh, and Texas than, than we do up here. Uh, and it makes sense because those are you know climates where it's warmer. People can be outside all the time. But if we had if we had dictated where we wanted to go and say you know next market is Chicago or next market is New York, um, we kind of you know we lose that more important you know user input. And so we wanted we wanted the areas that we were going to go into to be dictated by where the demand was actually coming from. Which is why we kind of opened the floodgates. We went nationwide, and then based on where we were seeing the most. Uh, demand coming from that's kind of where we concentrated our efforts. Um, so that that was a good learning experience, um, you know, early on and kind of a, a good example of us, uh, you know, having an idea and then kind of <laughs> quickly throwing it out and pivoting to something that we thought would be a little bit more effective. When you were having those early conversations with coaches to get them onto the platform, you gave a presentation at your alma mater, BU. You said that you have to fake it till you make it. And of course, you hear a lot of entrepreneurs say this, but I want to know, Ariane, what it's like to really fake it till you make. How does that feel internally when you're saying, "Oh, you know, we have this like huge grand vision," but inside you're like, "I have no idea if it's going to work." <laughs> um, it's a little bit unnerving, um, you know. It, it's it's more about perception. So when you say like "fake it till you make it." Um, it's, it's all about perception. So with us, we wanted everybody to look at our site and we wanted to think, we wanted them to look at the site and think that it was, you know, a multi-million dollar business and, you know, this, this big organization because that's really kind of where, where our vision is. Yeah, that, that's what we see it. And, uh, you know, great companies, you know, are, are not kind of, they don't just arrive one day and they're this big, massive organization, well-oiled and they work well. They start out that way. But just because they're, you know, they're not there yet doesn't mean that that's, you, you can't start putting the, uh, the initial groundwork and laying the foundation. So you know, when we say something like, you know, fake it until you make it and perception matters, that's kind of really the, the most important thing in my mind is you know, have, an idea, have an idea where you want to get to and where you want to go and what kind of organization you want to be because you have to start laying the ground, groundwork initially. You can't just get to be you know, a 500-person organization one day and all of a sudden say, okay, now we're going to start operating like, <laughs> uh, you know, like a massive corporation. It starts really from the time that you're a two- or three-person company and you have to keep that in mind as you're building the business and as it's evolving um, because if you don't, then you end up with you – know, uh, it, it gets very, uh, very confusing very quickly and uh, it gets very disorganized very quickly. And you guys participated in two accelerators, right? Mass Challenge and Techstars? That's right. Yep, both how up here in Boston. How were those experiences? Uh, they were great. Uh, they're very different experiences, but they both had um, had their advantages to it. So we went through the Mass Challenge accelerator first, and uh, you know Mass Challenge is a much bigger accelerator. So they let in I want to say somewhere in like the 200 company range. So there's a lot of companies going through it. Now the benefit of it is uh, you know you have you're exposed to a lot of other companies. They have a lot of um, 
mentors and portfolio companies in their network. So if you want to be connected with one of them, it's, it's normally, you know, chances are if, if there's a person, mentor, or company that you want to be connected with, they have a way to put you in touch with them. Perfect. Now, the, the disadvantage of that, of course, is because it's so big, you don't really get a lot of individual attention. And so it's really up to you to understand what your business needs, um, what, what your business needs are and who you want to be connected with and really take advantage of it and be proactive. Um, Techstars, on the other hand, was almost the exact opposite. So Techstars, they let in you know, maybe 12 to 14 companies every year. Uh, so it's much smaller. And they, um, you know, they still have, a very, they have an extremely good network, uh, but they work with you a lot closer. So there's actually like a set curriculum and a set program that you go through. It's a three-month program. And they work, you know, the, the folks running the program uh, work with you uh, very, very closely. So when we went through, it was uh, Katie Ray, Reed Sturdivant, and uh, uh, Bob Reed. And um, uh, Bob Mason, I'm sorry, not Bob Reed. Um, and uh, so they, they work with you almost every single day. And uh, they set you up with mentors specifically that are chosen for your company. And they th that, that they think will kind of help you in whatever aspect that your business needs or is struggling with. So um, that's the, the biggest advantage of Techstars is a lot of you know, very, very specific personal feedback. What are some of the key lessons that you took from mentors while you were at either accelerator? Um, there's a lot of them. So uh, I guess one of the biggest lessons is kind of transitioning, um, at, least, at least for me, is transitioning our engineering team from, you know, like a one or two person operation to an actual, you know, well gelled Team. So we went while well, we were in those accelerators from really just being myself and Gabe as the engineering team, so like a two-person engineering team, to being about an 11-person engineering wow. team, um, which, which, you know, it's not a huge jump, but at the same time, you know, it's uh, like I said, you have to understand where your business is going um, before you get there and lay the foundation right. So that's one of the biggest things that for me came out of that is kind of understanding how we need to take the engineering team because you, you work a lot differently when it's just two people kind of, you know, cranking features out until you get to a, a team that, you know, actually has specific roles where people can start to specialize a little bit and you can start to hire people specifically for your areas of weakness uh, and then kind of keeping them all on the same page and keeping everybody moving in the same direction. Uh, so that for me was one of the big advantages, um, you know, f from a organization standpoint is taking our, our engineering department from kind of like a small shop to uh, a very you know, well-processed um, engineering department. When it came to that in particular, how did you step back and become a manager? Because that used to be your baby. It still is your baby, but you're not exactly <laughs> like in it every moment now. Exactly, yeah. And so that goes, that goes back to just you know, wearing a lot of hats. Uh, you know, and in the early days, you know, it's one of those things that you don't really have a choice. You just have to do what you need. Yeah. So I went from, you know, literally just being an engineer coding every day and actually building the site to, um, you know, when we actually were able to raise some funds and can actually go out and get some help, you put the recruiter hat on and really go out and hire your team. But, you know, you have to really understand, to, you know, what you're, what you're going for, what your team needs before you can really go out and, and hire those people. Uh, and then once you have the team in place, then you need to, uh, yeah, then you need to manage them. So it's really a learning experience along the way. Uh, and I'm actually very grateful for going through um, the Techstars Accelerator because that was one of the biggest things that, for me, came out of it was, you know, understanding and kind of having that um, uh, that support network to fall back on when you know I had a question or kind of wasn't really sure what to do. It was you know it was one of those things where you don't you don't always have to take the advice that they give you, but it's always good to kind of bounce ideas off of and like vet them and just honestly just hear, hear yourself talk through it uh, out loud um, is one of the biggest advantages. But being able to have that kind of back and forth with someone who has been there, done that, and uh, is is more experienced than you is is very valuable. Um, and that's actually something um, I, sh I should probably mention that, that Jordan and I did from a very early time uh, in CoachUp is we always had this concept of our informal advisory council. Uh, and basically all that was was literally entrepreneurs and, and mentors that we had met just in the Boston tech community or really anywhere that you know, we kind of knew and respected their opinion. And what, one of the things that was probably most in instrumental when we were going through our bootstrap phase was once a month we would have a meeting, kind of a, a meeting of the minds, if you so to, speak, so to speak. And basically we just kind of got together this informal advisory council, which was kind of, you know, friends, mentors, other entrepreneurs, and, and basically bought them pizza, <laughs> bought them a bottle of wine, and really, like, 
put them all in a room and went through everything and said, okay, here's what Coach Up is working on right now. Here's where we were before. Here's the progress we've made and here are the challenges that we're facing. You know, can you guys help us think through some of these things? And just from having those people that we know and respected uh, in one room, uh, talking about the things that we're facing, uh, that was that like really instrumental because we had a lot of great ideas come, come out of that. Um, and uh, it, was, it was something that was very inexpensive to do because you know, it was just friends and, and folks that we knew from, from being in the startup community. So um, yeah, so that, that's one of the most instrumental things that I think we did that I actually attribute a lot of the early um, progress that we made to. Great. So I want to go back real quick and talk about hiring because you have some great stuff on your blog about that. You <laughs> shared, I love your blog. <laughs> you, you've shared that you want to know how people perform under pressure. How do you, how do you find that out in a conversation? Sure. So, um, I like it's that fast response. All right. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's difficult to do, uh, it's difficult to do in an interview, but the best thing to do is to remember that um, the best indication of future behavior is past behavior when it comes to people. Mm -hmm. And so um, in general, what I like to do if, if I'm trying to figure out how someone responds under pressure is um, kind of use a technique called behavioral interviewing, which you, you know, in, instead of focusing more on kind of what the, the candidate has written on their resume, kind of really get down in and dirty into you know past situations that they've been in and really just kind of dig. So um, you know instead of asking something about on a resume or like you know your uh, their experience that they have written down, I I'm more apt to ask someone about a, a past experience they've had and then just try to like you know pull out and uh, and tease out you know if if there is a situation where they're under pressure uh, like literally by asking them you know one was the, you know give me an example of the the hardest thing you've worked on in the last you know 6 months and why was it hard and just kind of um, you know drill back from there um, but yeah so the, the biggest thing to remember is that you know uh, future behavior is 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 probably going to their their past behavior is very very much an indication of future behavior so um, you know for for me that's that's the biggest thing is figuring out in their past how have they performed and why they made some of the decisions they made because going forward that's probably going to be you know a very similar um, thread to to what they're going to choose to do can you give me an example of one of your team members who gave you a killer response and you just thought in that moment I got to hire him him or her let me think so uh, so our uh, our past Android developer, I, I believe, he he gave a really really good good response when he was working. So he used to be uh, doing Android contracting, working on. Um, I think he was, said he was working on the Rula La app, but um, he, I remember one of his answers stood out very very uh, very well. Of you know he was working under a, a tight deadline, and I basically I think the question was something to the effect of you know give me an example of a past project that you've worked on and what you were either under a tight deadline or had limited resources with, you know, with which to work. Um, and I remember one of his responses being, I think he was working on a contracting um, gig and kind of at the 11th hour, there were a lot of scope creep items that came in to, to figure out uh, or that, that he, he had to address that, you know, um, or else the, the, the client didn't really want to consider the, the project complete. Uh, and I liked his response by, you know, he basically uh, kind of stood his ground and, um, came up to them and said, listen, you know, you, you obviously you're the boss, I'm, I'm here working for you, but um, this is impossible to get, get everything done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prioritize, uh, you know, the list of things that you want done and I'll give you kind of an estimate uh, of how long each is going to take. And then I'll let you kind of pick and choose which things that, you know, you want to get in. Um, so I, I really like that approach and, you know, I, I kind of look for those kind of res responses with, with team members that we hire of kind of the ability to uh, work under pressure, not crack under pressure, and to uh, respond logically with, um, you know, reasonable, reasonable things because th th those, those are things that happen every single day. And so, uh, especially in a startup, you have unexpected things left and right that comes up. You have uh, requirements that just kind of creep in from left field at like the 11th hour and the ability to be able to kind of like stop and say, okay, listen, uh, here's how I'm, I'm going to have to approach this and here's the time that we have left. And given that time, here's what I think we could reasonably do. And, you know, if you, if we absolutely have to have all of it, then, you know, somewhere we have to budge because, we have a limited number of hours in the day, and uh, we can't get you know can't fabricate time out of thin air. So that's uh, that's for me like the, the biggest things I, I look at, and I remember his answer um, really standing out in, in my mind. 
That's a great one, and it lends to something I learned in the first round review from Jessica McKellar over at Dropbox when she talked about stepping back and becoming a manager and helping her team members visualize their day-to-day -day goals and their year-to-year -year goals. How do you do that now? Because before it was just like, what am I going to do today? What am I going to do next year? And now you're doing it for a much bigger organization. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, one of the biggest things that I always um, I try to emphasize is uh, that we're, we're developers here. And yes, we have, you know, individual tasks that everybody can point to, you know, tangible tasks. But at the end of the day, um, it's, it's really about outcomes. And so I, I'm really someone who focuses more on outcomes rather than just pure production. Uh, you know, features in production, et cetera, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's, it's more important of how each developer um, treats their tasks such that it can contribute to the overall kind of big picture and move our business forward. Um, so that's one of the things I try to see and try to instill in, in, in team members more than anything is that it's, it's really about outcomes. And, you know, one of the reasons why I like working for uh, smaller companies and startups so much is because you can actually tangibly see how your efforts are affecting the business as a whole, which I think is super cool. And, uh, you know, so I try, to, I try to emphasize that to my team as much as possible that, you know, remember, you know, we, we run a, you know, a, a scrum-like process. We have sprints where there's, you know, individual tasks and, you know, we measure how many tasks we can get through every week. But at the end of the day, it's not really about quantity. Uh, it's really about, you know, what outcomes do we have that positively affected the business? And uh, so the way I approach it is, you know, yes, you can point to the tasks, but at the end of the day, you also want to show them, you know, look at, look at the, some of the business metrics that we're monitoring and, you know, keep in mind the reason why uh, some of these features that we're having you guys work on is because we want the business to move in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that to me is kind of the, the biggest thing to do is kind of, kind of give them a mirror to the business and, and say, you know, the reason why we're doing X, Y, and Z is because this is important to the business for these couple reasons. Uh, and so that, I, mean, I mean, that's at least one way that, that I try to kind of show the team, um, you know, the, the progress that not just they're making, but the progress that they're helping the business overall make. So, um, and, and I've, I find that you know people people love that, and it's interesting, and it's something that is very unique to small companies that bigger companies don't have because you can't necessarily see how you know your individual contribution affects a you know business when it's a you know multi billion dollar business. But when you're a, a small startup and you're working as you know part of a you know twenty person company, your, your efforts yeah. matter. Yeah. When it comes to that startup culture, I saw a great quote that really stuck out to me stuck out to me from Matt Lowe, who's on your team. And he said that your culture is very work hard, but don't take yourself too seriously. And I've heard a couple of founders say that lately, work hard, don't take yourself too seriously. How do you do that? Because it's very hard not to take yourself yeah. too seriously. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. It's, it's a hard balance. Um, and I think it's, it has more to do with uh, the personality of people that you hire rather than um, you know, culture is one of those things, you, you can't create a culture, you can't just fabricate it and say, you know, you, you, can, you can take a piece of paper, write down a bunch of, you know, this is our culture, values. and then, yeah, values and, pla you know, plaster on the wall, but at the end of the day, that doesn't really mean anything. Uh, the people who um, work for your company and the people who you hire and that you surround yourself with, they're going to set your culture. So no matter what your values say, that's where your culture is coming from. And so I think the biggest part is um, finding people who are exactly like that. Like for us, you know, we're, we're lucky in that we're a sports company and that uh, a lot of people have the background of you know, working on teams and playing on teams where teamwork matters. Um, and you, you can see it. You know, it's, it's interesting. We went on a company retreat last year. And uh, you know, it, the easiest way, I think, to describe it is we have a lot of people who are very competitive at nature, but they're not jerks. You know? <laughs> and they, and they, like, they like competing. They like winning. But winning isn't everything and they know that it's more important to kind of, you know, work as a team. I remember, you know, we, I think we were on a retreat and we were playing, we were playing some board game and it, and it was, it was interesting. One of the other guys in the team was like, you know, this is one of the reasons why I like working for Coach Up so much is just in the board game, like people were getting so competitive and like really like putting their all in, like wanting to win. But at the end of it, we're like, well, that was fun. That was a game, whatever, you know. So, you know, I've heard that a lot uh, specifically in reference to our culture that, you know, people like working here because it is like that. Like people like winning, they like competing and they like, you know, doing the absolute best they can be. 
uh, the, the best thing they can do. But at the end of the day, they realize that it's a team and it's about you know total teamwork and it's about the company kind of moving and working together. And I think that's how we kind of keep it fun. Um, so, you know, we, we work hard and uh, every, everybody likes competing and winning. But at the end of the day, they realize that everybody's on the same team, which makes it fun. I love it. So I want to shift gears for a couple of minutes and talk about a great post that you wrote in Forbes back in November about celebrity partnerships. And, you know, today, like like you we were talking about with it taking a lot of work to build a startup, you guys have great relationships with Steph Curry, with Julian Edelman, but that didn't happen overnight. You start right. the post with number one being when it comes to defining a list of celebrities, you want to find people who also really represent your brand. Because if you bring on someone who doesn't, you're just creating complications for the future. How does it work when you're getting that list down? <laughs> um, well, it's tough. It's a, you know, like anything else, it's a lot of work on your end. Um, for for CoachUp, you know, we really knew what we wanted to go after because um, you know both Jordan and I had had private coaching stories. We knew how big of a role it played on our lives, and so we knew that we wanted to go and get you know prominent athletes and figures who had very very similar experience. Um, so for us, that's kind of what we started with. Is you know we want to go after people. We, we don't want people that just have pure raw talent. So we didn't want to go after someone like a LeBron James who you know I was, was just, just kind of say I would have picked yeah. up the phone and been like LeBron, come help <laughs> me out. <laughs> yeah, no, we purposely didn't do that because you know he's he's an amazing athlete, but he has a lot of just raw natural talent, and a lot of it just comes from just being very naturally gifted. Uh, whereas if you look at someone like Steph Curry, that that's not really the case. He's not like you know he wasn't born great. He wasn't you know super naturally gifted. He got to where he is through a lot of hard work and kind of mastering his craft. Um, and I, you know we have a couple of, uh, of videos on, on Coach Up uh, where we interview his parents and uh, and chat with them, and they say exactly that. You know, even even going back to you know when he was in college and first breaking into the NBA, people kind of dismissed him and didn't really think that you know he had what it what it takes. And so you know that just goes to show that he was not a very gifted ath you know gifted athlete and just didn't have raw talent. He got to where he is by working hard and through private coaching. And so we specifically wanted to find athletes who had um, stories like that. Uh, and so, you know, when you when you think of it from that aspect, you go from oh, there's so many you know celebrity athletes out there to really there's only kind of a couple that we really wanted to go after. Um, and so, you know, Julian Edelman was another one perfect perfect story um, for us because he was the same way, like very disregarded when he came into the league. Uh, was actually a quarterback in college, and a lot of people have no idea because you know he's a, he's a star wide receiver now. But he basically was a quarterback in college, and there was no position for him when he got to the uh, the NFL on the Patriots. And so what he did is he made a position for himself, and he got a a wide receiver coach and worked at it, and uh, is now one of, one of the best at it. He's so doing okay now. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, it was very very deliberate that we went after athletes specifically who um, like represented our brand through private coaching. When it comes to getting that list down, I love that you pointed out how important it is to almost treat a celebrity's agent like you would a VC. So when you're sending them something, don't just send them a copy-pasted email and input Steph Curry's <laughs> name in the, in the little blank line. I hate when people do that. Exactly. What were your experiences like reaching out to agents, working with them, pitching with them? Uh, it's interesting and it varies greatly. Um, <laughs> and this is actually one of the biggest things that. Uh, and if Jordan were here, he would he would say the he would say this because he's the one that kind of interfaces with the agents uh, more on like a basically like a daily basis and weekly wow. basis. Um, but the relationship that you have with um, kind of the manager or the agent almost matters more than the relationship that you have with the athlete themselves because they're the person you're going to be dealing with. Um, and so, you know, from from very early on in in kind of the the relationship, you want to make sure that the manager or the you know whoever you're going to be dealing with on behalf of the athlete is also really bought in with with your company and your beliefs and your ideals and your values because they're the ones that you know when you say uh, you know hey we have this new uh, we have a new release coming out and we love to you know have have Seth send out this text or send out this you know this post on social media um, you know you, you don't want them to see it as a burden you want them to see it as oh this is something that Steph's involved with that we know he really believes in mm -hmm. and so this is something that could really help to the company and kind of tie into his personal story better. And so they're more apt to, you know, um, to, to, to do things for you like that when, uh, when you need them. And that's really the most important thing. Um, 
you know, because part of a celebrity uh, endorsement is getting the celebrity to kind of be on board and say yes, but then a lot of people don't realize the, the hard work comes after the endorsement is set uh, and really leveraging it and taking advantage of it because it's not a set it and forget it type thing. It's really something that uh, it requires a lot of attention. You know, every time the the athlete is going to have um, you know a prominent appearance, whether it's on TV or uh, you know magazine or um, has an interview, uh, you you want to make sure that you know you're there and you re, you know constantly remind them that you know this is something that you're involved in and you know here are the key kind of takeaways and key talking points if it comes up. Because uh, keep in mind, you know, <laughs> celebrity athletes they have a ton of things that they're doing and they don't have you know necessarily the time to always have your company top of mind. And so uh, the only way that you're really going to leverage that endorsement to the fullest extent is to really do the legwork for them. So uh, that's kind of the, the other side of the coin of getting a celebrity endorsement is managing the ongoing relationship. And but even before you reach out to them, you noted in that post that you should have an internal plan of exactly. what you're going to do. So that even just highlights what you said even more. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and one of the one of the reasons why you have that plan is, you know, it helps you figure out who you want to go after as well. Because, you know, based on you know the athlete and their personality, you know, the plans can change. You know, some people, uh, I mean, it's obvious, right? Like some some athletes and celebrities are uh, much more involved in social media and Twitter, and you know, some some do more appearances than other. But you know, their uh, their personalities vary. Um, their level of engagement varies. So based on who you want involved with your company, uh, your plan, you know, changes based on on, on the athlete. No, I'll just give you a heads up then. I before you target me for my varsity golf skills, <laughs> I, I'm not that into it anymore. So I don't think the oh, internal yeah. plan will be too good. <laughs> okay, well, we'll keep that in mind. I'll, I'll make a I'll make a note right here. Just so you know, happy to help, but maybe not on that. End. <laughs> Shifting to the future, Ian. What are the core metrics you guys are using to measure your growth right now? Uh, so there's a couple. Um, so we we, all, we always monitor um, active users, so active uh, active athletes who come and actually book a, a lesson on our site. Um, one of the, one of the core metrics that we are always trying to optimize is just like the the number of uh, packages purchased per athlete. So with CoachUp right now, one of our biggest strengths is discovery. So we're a discovery platform because you know just as I said, you know Jordan and I growing up had this problem of being able to find and just be connected with a coach that we knew and trusted uh, and we knew could could help us get us. Uh, where we wanted to be. So that's one of the biggest advantages that we have uh, is being able to connect athletes and, and private coaches. But beyond that, we, we don't just want to be about discovery. We want to really be with an athlete every step of their way um, along their development. And so what we're doing is we're building a lot of tools that kind of help them along the way in terms of you know, some analytic tools, being able to view and oh, see all wow. their feedback in, 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 one, you know, in, one, in one place. We give the coach a mobile app to basically run uh, a private coaching business from the palm of their hand. So while it's important for us to be very good at discovery and helping people make that initial connection with a private coach, one of the big things that we're really focused on is repeat business because we want to peep, keep people using the platform and basically be a value add after the, the, the athlete finds a coach that they want to work with. So uh, one of the biggest things that we do is we monitor the number of repeat sessions that um, the athletes take. And uh, we monitor that on both sides. So we monitor on the athlete how many sessions they take and then on the coach how many of their clients come back and rebook packages because that's one of the metrics that we use to determine whether or not the coach is a good coach or not. So um, that, that, those are kind of a, a couple of just like the key metrics um, that we're monitoring. And, you know, the, the other thing is there's, there's so many things that you can monitor. You really, have to, uh, you really have to zero in on what you think is important. Um, or other, otherwise you can get into, you know, analysis paralysis and just there's just data coming in from, from every which way. And so, you know, one of the things I think that's actually important for startups to do is figure out, um, you know, not the realm of possibilities of data they can monitor, but really maybe a couple, like two or three main pieces of data that they really want to use to gauge uh, growth and gauge kind of the health of their business. That lends to another point you brought up in that BU presentation when you shared that you have to structure your business to scale for the future. And it reminds me of the way you just said, like we could be looking at everything, but we know, for example, that a repeat session is most important. How did you figure that out early on? Um, 
it's it's one of those things where it's a little bit of uh, it's a little bit of art and a little bit of science. Um, you know, it's interesting when you when you start a when you start a business. A lot of people say, you know, uh, one of the best ways to to figure out what features work, what features don't work, is use A/B testing and you know uh, figure out you know. It, Launch a feature, see what how it does against your existing, you know, control, and then if it's uh, if it's improved, if it improves, stick with it, and if not, you know, don't. The the kind of caveat that a lot of people don't realize or a lot of people don't tell you is when you're super early in your business, you don't really have the the numbers to get to statistical significance, and so a lot of it is kind of just uh, doing gut checks, and so. Um, you know, being a, I'm a firm believer of really using your own product, and so you know, I I take uh, at least a coach up lesson every single week, uh, as does Jordan uh, and a lot of the folks here, and so a lot of it comes with using and understanding your own product and knowing kind of where the pain points are because you'll hit them. You know, if you if you use your product enough, you'll say, oh man, this is a really a pain. We need to make maybe make a change here or look into this. Um, so really, it's it's using your own product and kind of understanding where those pain points are, and then making a change for the better, and then testing it out to see whether or not um, it works. Um, the other aspect, when you don't have enough volume going through your site to really figure out uh, if a feature works or not, is uh, just getting your product out into the hands of, of real users and doing actual user testing, um, not as a substitute for A/B testing, but you know, at least for that initial kind of uh, initial gut check to to say, okay, maybe this you know maybe this should be tweaked or changed. Um, but it's really just about it's about giving yourself as much information as you possibly can to make an intelligent guess. But at the end of the day, it's really it's really more or less guessing um, and understanding your product enough to make a very educated guess, and then validating that with you know whatever data you think is is going to be important to to either validate or invalidate your assumption. When it comes to your own lessons, are you just doing sailing and skiing ones, or are you doing it all across the board? No, I actually I take boxing lessons and yoga. So uh, boxing is just something that I've been wanting to get into for a while, and it's actually probably one of the best cardio workouts I've I've ever gotten. So uh, I do that once a week as a as I do yoga once a week. Um, and I used to do yoga, just go to, to classes, mm -hmm. but you know I have some specific areas of uh, that, you know of flexibility that I want to work on. And uh, I find that you know having a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> instructor and saying like, listen, I'm I'm tight in my back and you know I'm I'm starting to run more and my my legs and IT band really hurt and they need to be stretched out. That's uh, it's it's important because they can focus on exactly what you want to do. And so I found that you know results come a lot quicker. Um, you know, mm -hmm. obviously when you when you're focused just one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's important to note too because it shows that coach up is not just for. The athlete who wants to play at a professional level or is a professional. Exactly, yeah. And actually, one of the, uh, it, it's surprising. A lot of people kind of look at Coach Up and assume that this is a service that's only for elite athletes or mm -hmm. only for athletes who want to compete at a high level. And that's really not the case at all. Actually, the, the number one user on our site are kids in middle school and high school. Um, and we actually see a lot of people who are getting a private coach just because they want to break into a sport for the first time. Um, or maybe they want to, you know, make varsity, or maybe they're on the bench and they want to earn a starting position. But uh, you know, uh, I think there maybe is a little bit of a misconception that it's only for elite athletes because most of our uh, most of our athletes are actually not elite athletes. They're they're kids in middle school and high school. Awesome. So, two last questions. Sure. The first one is a great lesson that I learned from Heidi Roizen in the first round review. She said, if you fall down and don't get back up, you'll be down for the rest of your life. When is a moment that you fell down, whether it was personally or professionally, and you got back up and it was the best thing that you could have done? Hmm. Let me think of that. Hmm. Wise words. They're <laughs> hers. <not mine. laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, there are there are a lot of instances in uh, in just starting coach up that um, I don't know if I would ever call it just just down, but um, a lot of instances where the outcomes were not necessarily what we what we uh, what we wanted. So you know, early in the business, while we were raising money and like going through and trying to actually uh, you know get money to to fund the business and continue uh, continue building it, there are a lot of times where you know, <laughs> especially this last round we put together, there are a lot of investors that we wanted to go and, and talk to that. Um, just flat out told us no, or that they weren't interested. And um, you know, when you're starting a business, and especially if you're um, you know raising money, you have to get used to hearing no a lot. 
um, which for me was, was something unique because, um, you know, when you start a business, you know, you have to start with passion. You have to really believe in what you're doing. And like, I really believe in Coach Up and I'm very passionate about it, you know, not just from my background, but, you know, I, I love the folks I work with and I think that, you know, the, the service that we have really is making an impact in, and uh, positively affecting um, young, young folks' lives. So um, when you kind of put that next to like, you know, taking it, uh, want to take, wanting to take it to the next level and then hearing no a lot, uh, that kind of, it stings, but it's one of those things where you just kind of have to shake it off and, and move on. And while raising, raising money, you know, we, Jordan and I heard no a ton and there were a lot of investors that we really wanted to go after that said no. And so that, that to me was one of the biggest lessons because, you know, this is both of our first, uh, companies that we've ever tried to start. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it stung a lot trying to kind of get over that initial hurdle and get things going and get the flywheel spinning. So that, that to me was kind of one of the, the Thankfully biggest. Thankfully it got spinning. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, that was one of the biggest learnings for me. 2014 was a huge year for your team, but I think that 2015 has already shaped up to be even bigger. What do you want to be toasting on at the holiday Christmas party? Hmm. So I want to. So the the big vision for for me, and I know Jordan shares this as well, is we really want to um, create an entire movement of um, coach entrepreneurs. And what we're really trying to do is create a new industry. Um, that's really the. That's the what ultimate. I like to hear. This is exciting. Well, yeah. I mean, so we're we're really trying to em, em, empower a nation of coach entrepreneurs of um, you know coaches who, uh, and we know that they're out there because they're using our platform right now. Um, and we've seen that there's a lot of coaches out there who um, have competed at a high level, a lot of athletes who have competed at a high level, um, have the ability to coach and give back, and they want to you know, pay it forward, um, but they're not business people. They're not going to go out and start a business on their own. But what we found is if you give them the tools that they need and literally hand everything to them, they're more than willing, uh, if you make it easy enough, to, to go out and do this. So ultimately, you know, the big vision is we really want to create this new industry of people who they say, you know, what do you do for a living? And we want them to respond, oh, I'm a private coach and I use the CoachUp pr platform to power my business. So ultimately, that's kind of the, the grand vision of, of where we want to get to. Um, and we're on our way there. We're just a lot of, a lot of folks that, um, you know, use CoachUp to right now supplement their income. And uh, we're moving to the, to the point where uh, we're starting to see the first, uh, you know, first couple of folks really generate enough income on the platform to really move to doing this really full time and use it not just as kind of supplementary, suppl supplementary income, but also uh, just use it as, you know, this is what I do for a living. I'm a private coach and coach up is my platform. So ultimately, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's kind of where we, where we want to get to. No, that's the, that's the perfect response. That's what I love to hear. And I think that's so extraordinary that you guys in such a short time, certainly not to dismiss all the hard work <laughs> that it took to get there because we were talking about that. I think it's so amazing that you're creating that business for coaches to be a private coach because that's what they love. And oftentimes you can't do that and live off of it. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's important. Uh, that's a good point that you bring up there. Just being able to do something that you love is something that's super important. And a lot of people don't have that. You know, if you ask most people... Most people are unhappy in their jobs, and so if we can provide this this outlet and provide this platform and let people uh, not just do what they love but earn a living doing it, that's kind of the best of both worlds. You know, we hear all the time uh, a lot of coaches would say, you know, this is just what I love doing. I love coaching. I love giving back. I would do it for free. And mm -hmm. so if we can let them do that but earn a living on it, I think that's uh, that's pretty cherry on top. Exactly. Thank you so much for being with me today. How can everyone get started using CoachUp and stay up to date with what you guys are working on? Uh, it's easy. Just visit our site, uh, coachup.com, uh, or if you want to uh, download our mobile app, we're on Android or iOS. So um, just check us out. And uh, yeah, anything that you need, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find it right there. Perfect. Thank you so much for being with me today. Well, thanks very much for having me on. It was great chatting.